In 1930, Mahatma Gandhi and a handful of supporters marched some 240 miles to the sea to make salt. That is to say, they gathered up and thereby claimed that life-sustaining mineral as their birthright, not a commodity controlled exclusively by their British colonizers. For that act of civil disobedience, those Indian salt marchers and the tens of thousands who soon joined them were arrested en masse. While you, I, and our fellow Americans are today free to march to the ocean and collect salt, if so moved, to say that we are in charge of our food supply is nevertheless a fiction. But shouldn't we be? Joining me today from New Mexico to explore how we might become sovereigns of the food, water, and land that nourish us is Beverly Bell, Associate Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies and founder of the nonprofit education and movement building collaborative, Other Worlds. She's the author of four books, most recently, Harvesting Justice, Transforming Food, Land, and Agriculture Systems in the Americas, the basis of our conversation today. Welcome to Wide Angle, Bev. Thank you, Peter. I'm so happy to be here. I just began the conversation with an assertion that some people might challenge, um, that our being in control of our food systems is a fiction. Uh, so if it's not we who are in charge of our food systems, who is it? Who or what is it? Well, these days, an ever-shrinking number of mega corporations controls an ever-expanding amount of food production, from seeds to equipment, from chemical inputs to processing. I have here, from the book you just referenced, Harvesting Justice, a few statistics. Just four companies own approximately 84% of the U.S. beef market. Four firms control 66% of the pork packing market, and another four control 58% of poultry processing. Four companies own 43% of the world's commercial seed market. Three companies control 90% of the global trade in grain, and four companies own 48% of grocery retailers, Walmart being, of course, the largest. On the other end, at the same time, one family farmer goes out of business in the United States each week. I think that that pretty well paints the picture without any further analysis being needed. Right, right. You spoke there of corporations on, on one hand, small, small uh, family farms on the other end. Somewhere in the middle there, no doubt, rests our governments. Um, the cynic in me would think that, typically, corporations are focused on the bottom line. Um, I'd like to think that my own government, on the other hand, is maybe party to this problem, uh, not by intention, but by simple oversight. Is that hope reasonably placed? And beyond that, I guess, what, um, what role does our government play in the way our food systems operate today? Well, I would say your hope is reasonably placed, <clears throat> but unfortunately it does not reflect reality. Mm -hmm. And the role that the government, our government, if you can call it that, I'm not sure that they represent us, but the government in Washington anyway, the role that they play very much reflects the figures of the ever-growing control of a very few corporations over all of our food supplies, be it animals, be it um, plants, be it the water that allows the plants to grow and allows the animals to live, be it the land that the animals are um, housed on and that the food plants are growing on. Um, and there is an ever-growing revolving door between, well, we I think most of your viewers will know this, between corporations in general and the U.S. government, and it plays out in many overt and covert ways. Um, and that is certainly true with agribusiness. Agribusiness is an enormous lobby in Washington, D.C., and there is a um, very close relationship between them and certainly many congressional offices. Also, the Department of Agriculture is hardly a neutral force and hardly stands up typically to small farmers. It's really much more about enabling uh, corporations. Let's just take one example, Peter, which is that of subsidies. <clears throat> so subsidies were created uh, after World War II as a way to protect 
small farmers who were really having trouble competing with large farmers, something I think all of us could get behind. That's a very noble use of our tax dollars to try and empower those who've always grown, family farmers who uh, needed some help. Today, almost all of subsidies go to underwrite the production of these corporations um, so that, in fact, we are paying for there to be the growth every year of surplus corn and surplus sugar. Mm -hmm. When I say surplus, these are crops that will not be put on our tables at all. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, many of them are dumped in low-income countries. The U.S. gets uh, moral kudos for, quote, food aid, but in fact, a lot of that is just a way to keep the subsidy system going. Let's leave uh, our, our government and, and corporations then off to the side for just a moment. And although they are both composed of humans, um, sometimes we lose that aspect when, when we talk about them. So let's look at, let's look at people, individuals, you and I. Um, I think many Americans would intellectually accept the idea that food is a human right. And yet, I think there would be significant resistance if we suggested that food should somehow exist outside of the prevailing economic system and uh, be more right than it is currently commodity. Yeah? Um, how, might, how might we make that shift? I think cognitively we need to make it, and then we need to practically make it, from food as commodity to food as true human right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, a commodity, I looked it up actually prior to this show, is a raw material or a primary agricultural product that can be bought or sold. In a world where there is hunger, in a world where there is food scarcity, which, and I hope we will talk about this, is not due to lack of food, but it's, it's the way that food is distributed and who has access to it. But regardless, as long as there is hunger, food as, as profit uh, should not ever be allowed to stand. So there is a human right to food, and it is not recognized in this country, but it is in many. In Brazil, for example, there is a policy of zero hunger. And there are actually laws on the books that say that any policy that uses food to give primacy to profit over that of feeding people yeah. is not legal. Oh. And that, therefore, um, everything must be done by the government to ensure that everyone has that food. We can see examples of this all over the world. We are really very behind in this country in many things. I know we like to think that we are out in front mm -hmm. as the global superstar, and that is true in terms of overconsumption mm -hmm. and military, mm -hmm. among other things, <clears throat> but in terms of envis envisaging food as a basic human right, that does not exist here, and I would say that that is a big part of the problem. Well then, let's 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 shift a little bit. Let's shift gears. Uh, certainly, one of the central features in in your book, Harvesting Justice, is the notion of food sovereignty. Um, mm -hmm. I think probably for many of, of the viewers today, it's a relative. It would it would be a new term, um, and yet the notion of food sovereignty is one that has taken root in many other parts of the world over the past twenty years. Um, what is food sovereignty? And why have we been so slow to warm to the idea? Well, it would challenge the very commodity structure that we have been talking about on which modern U.S. agriculture has been premised mm -hmm. since the end of World War II. Food sovereignty is pretty much the reverse of what we've been speaking about. And it is very exciting to see it in the last, I'd say, three years become a uh, concept that is discussed for the U.S. Because as you mentioned, for 20 or so years, this has been um, in the building, in the agenda for the struggle for rights um, for people all over the world. <clears throat> to explain what it is for your viewers, it is an expansive set of policies, programs, and practices that say that each nation has the right to produce its own food, mm -hmm. 
for its own people with fair trade, with fair labor practices, and in environmentally healthy conditions. I have here a declaration from the first global meeting on food sovereignty, which took place in Mali in 2007. And farmers and activists from all over the world came together for this. And their final declaration speaks of six principles of food sovereignty. And they are first, focusing on the rights of people. Secondly, valuing food providers. Thirdly, localizing food systems. Fourthly, making decisions locally. Fifth, building knowledge and skills. And six, working with nature. Hmm. Imagine how different our country would be yeah, yeah. if that were how our food, land, and agriculture were organized. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess on the other side, yeah, we might hear um, restoring family farms, um, establishing organic practices, uh, f uh, es establishing food sovereignty, as, as you just outlined it. They're admirable goals, and yet we run into the, the hard realities at some point of, for instance, our population. Uh, 7.4 billion today, um, projected to be 9.7 billion by the year 2050. Um, what, what would you say to people who suggest that um, industrial scale agriculture, a globalized food system, is the only way to feed that many people? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. What I would say is that that is a myth. Mm. In fact, that studies have shown that small-scale farming is actually more efficient mm. than global industrial farming. Furthermore, Peter, we don't have a food crisis. Mm. According to the UN, there is enough food on the, in the world mm. to feed 12 billion wow. people. We're going to take a, a quick break there, Bev. Uh, we've been talking about maddening problems with our food systems. I promise that the second part of the show, after this break, We'll talk about solutions. Please join us on the other side. If you live in one of the 22 communities that appear on your screen now, you likely belong to the Mystic River watershed. This vital resource is a natural living system that we all share. Since 1972, the Mystic River Watershed Association has successfully fought to protect and restore this treasure. Now I'm asking you to join that effort please go to mysticriver.org to become a member and to find out how you can help today. Welcome back to Wide Angle. I'm Peter Bermuda speaking today with Beverly Bell about our food system. Uh, Bev, welcome back. Thank you. I'm still so happy to be with you. I'm glad to hear it. So, so I made the promise when we left the, uh, our viewers at the, at the last half that we'd come back and we'd talk about solutions and the, the sort of the, the bright side of what is otherwise a very challenging picture. Um, so, so please help me make good on this um, and, and let's sort of launch into what I, I hope will be a, a, an engaging and informative and, uh, and, and positive portion, yeah? Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Community-supported agriculture, uh, farmers markets, Arlington has a farmers market every Wednesday afternoon over the summer. Um, these are things that are, are making an impact and a difference in our local communities and sort of cueing us into um, a, more, a more local and sustainable way of getting our food. Um, what are impacts such as these uh, that link farms with their wider communities? Uh, what are they having on people's uh, access to quality food, as well as the sustainability of small farms? I'm so happy that you moved us to the second part of this conversation, mm -hmm. because there are solutions and alternatives being forged throughout the world. We hear of them less here mm -hmm. for two reasons. First of all, because there is such a greater control over our food by corporations, as we discussed. And secondly, because your program and some other wonderful programs accepted, our news here is controlled by those same corporations. So 
we are not seeing the stories that are out there that are shining and beautiful. But yes, it would be hard to miss the growth of farmers markets and CSAs, that is community supported agriculture mm -hmm. in this country. Both of them are growing like weeds and they are a wonderful way to shorten the distance between the um, place where food is grown or uh, plants or animals, and where it is marketed, uh, there is there are discu different discussions of averages, some debate, but typically most pieces of our food that we would buy in a conventional grocery store have traveled from 1,000 to 2,000 miles. <clears throat> That's insane. I got a little snack bag of trail mix in an airplane one time, and it listed the possible sources mm. of the food in that little bag as coming from six different countries around the world. So there is a need to localize because that is how citizens can better reclaim control over their food, and that is how small farmers um, and organic farmers, notably, will be able to survive. And I mentioned earlier in the program that an average of one small farmer a week is going out of business. Mm -hmm. So these CSAs, these farmers markets, these um, the, the awareness, notably, the growing awareness of people of what is involved in supporting a local food system, mm -hmm. a local food shed, all of these together are really shifting the debate and shifting practices, and we hope that they will shift policies at the level of Washington so that we can have in this country moved towards that food sovereignty that we discussed earlier. Right, right. Um, certainly in, in, in Harvesting Justice, you introduce a number of organizations, um, the, the, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, uh, the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance, uh, Via Campesina, uh, organ <coughs> excuse me, organizations across the world that are working to improve our access to and our control of our food. Um, you're directly connected with one of the strongest grassroots movements in Central America, the Civic Council of Popular and Indigenous Organizations of Honduras, COPIN for short. It's a mouth, mouthful, and it suggests the promise of their work, yes? Tell us, tell us a bit about what COPIN is, is doing in Honduras. Sure. Some of your viewers will know the name of COPIN's uh, founder and leader for several decades. That name is Berta Cáceres, and she is known both because she won the very prestigious Goldman Environmental Award two years ago, but also because she was assassinated this year on March 2nd, and that assassination has gotten a lot of international attention. Um, yes, I live in Honduras, and I work with this organization full-time. Uh, on top of the group Other Worlds that I run, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And they are a stunning example of what a small group of people can do when they put their hearts and minds together. Copin, though it doesn't have money, it doesn't have big fancy connections, it does not have arms, it doesn't believe in arms. Um, it has in fact changed the landscape for the protection of native food, agriculture, and land in Honduras. <clears throat> and what they have been able to do sheerly by grassroots organizing among the 200 plus communities that are organized into this group, all mm -hmm. Lenca, indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. is to remain living on their land, Many, most of them, which is actually no small feat because the attempts to get them off that land, as with indigenous peoples all over Honduras and all over Central America, South America, and indeed in global South countries all over the world is huge. The reason that there is such a push from lands is indigenous lands is that indigenous peoples are the ones who have best safeguarded the riches of nature mm. in their territories. So the um, the so-called natural resources, which I like to think of as the natural commons or the riches of Mother Earth, uh, that we want, that we need to power our cell phones. This is coltan that's mined in Central Africa mm -hmm. to make uh, our glasses. This is uh, titanium that was mined I don't know where. Um, all of these things sit under other people's lands 
And so in order to get those things, we need to get the people off their lands. And that is what U.S. and Canadian corporations, most notably, are doing around the world. So for indigenous peoples, organized through this group, Copine, to be able to stay in their communities is huge. Right. And it's, and it's really that, that, that ability and the inclination uh, to stand up to power that you, you, you're speaking to um, that I'd like to sort of shift gears to. Um, certainly many of, the, many of the people that you recognize in Harvesting Justice are indigenous peoples, be they the Lanka in, in Honduras, Zapatistas in, in Mexico, Garifunda, Garifuna in, in Honduras also. Um, what, do these, what do these peoples, uh, and why do they seem particularly uh, ready to assume the challenges of, of food sovereignty? And what could they teach us about uh, standing up to, to power? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, to take, take your second question first, we have many, many lessons to learn in this country about refusing to believe the lies, refusing to be intimidated, refusing to be manipulated, refusing to be silenced. Um, we have seen this certainly um, throughout the, this electoral cycle, regardless of which candidate you might be for, if either. Um, you certainly have probably been sickened by watching the facts be twisted, and I would suggest that that is only an exaggeration of what we as U.S. people are subject to. What I love about people in many other countries is that their imaginations and their thought processes have not yet been bought mm -hmm. because, of course, that is the first key to getting us to sit down and shut up and um, be passive. And that is how we get to the sort of food system and the sort of cor corporate controlled nation that we have today. Mm -hmm. So it's not too late for us. Um, we have seen it in Black Lives Matter. We have seen it in Occupy Wall Street. You know, we've seen it in the Middle East with the um, Arab Springs. We've seen it in Europe with the anti-austerity measures. We've seen it in Mexico with the huge movement that has risen up in response to the 43 student teachers who were murdered a couple of years ago in Ayotzinapa in southern Mexico. <clears throat> and it's, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that as well here, to stand up and reclaim our government, um, actually begin having a real democracy instead of the one that is you know, masqueraded as such today, and to retake our food. One thing about food, unlike almost anything else, is that it affects every single solitary person in the most personal way. Mm -hmm. And that's an extraordinary leverage point, you know? And the mothers who send their kids off to eat pink slime or the mothers who can't get food stamps for their children because the subsidies program has been so screwed up and food stamps is a subsidy of a different sort. Uh, and the many of us who really long for something different, who would love to know our farmers, who would love to know that the food we eat is organic but that we don't have to pay $10 for a head of spinach. I mean, there are just so many ways that I see people in this country really beginning with food as a starting point for change. And we can do it with food and we can do it with everything else in this country. And if we don't believe that, we have only to look at the history, though it's not brought into our television uh, sets <clears throat> and into our radios and our cars. But in fact, people all over the world are winning victories and they are reclaiming their power and their land and their food. And it can happen here too, but we do need to organize for that. Right. Noam Chomsky said, if you want everything to stay exactly the way it is, just do nothing. Right, right. And let's say, let's say that there are viewers who absolutely do want to make, take that step. Um, they are involved with CSA, they go to the farmer's markets, um, they uh, till at the community gardens. Um, they are interested in uh, shifting perhaps their behaviors around food to help create perhaps uh, a more just food system. How, uh, how, do we, how do we practically go about doing that? What, what concrete steps might people take away from this conversation to go in that direction and create that, that future of, of, of greater democracy, of, of greater access to, to food? There are wonderful organizations throughout the United States that are helping connect citizens up with policy changes because this really does come down to policies. If your viewers go on our website, 
which is otherworldsarepossible.org. They can find their way to um, a page that will list many organizations that are working exactly to do what you say, Peter, which is to help us get power because it's hard to understand these very complicated topics. Mm -hmm. There are many ways that citizens in this country can reclaim our power and can reclaim what is on our plate and the processes through which the food there has been created and has been marketed and who makes the profit for that and who controls that and who sits on the land where your beans were grown, et cetera. So I encourage all of your viewers to become involved. It doesn't mean that you need to spend 30 hours a week and drop other things that you're doing, but food is something that we do several times every day, some of us many times every day we engage with, and it is something that we need to be involved with. Again, we cannot leave it to the lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Yeah. It's certainly my sense, Bev, that we could we could have a very fruitful discussion for quite some time, uh, but between us here. Um, however, uh, we come to the, we come near the close of, of our conversation for now, and I'm wondering if there is anything that we haven't discussed uh, today that you feel would be important for viewers to know uh, about our food systems, about food sovereignty, anything along those lines. I think it is important for people to realize that the state of the world, just to take the topics that we're discussing with so much hunger and with so much landlessness, did not come to be. They are the result of policy choices. Mm -hmm. And again, I always hold in my heart that quote by Jean Siegler that every child that dies of hunger has been assassinated. That was a set, there were a set of decisions made. I'm not saying, of course, that someone sat down and decided that children should be hungry. However, there have been decisions made as to who gets to benefit from food, land, and agriculture in this country. And in fact, Peter, that gives me a huge amount of hope. Because if these policies were created, they can be uncreated. There can be different and better options. But we know that in any form of political system and in any country, the only way that that is going to happen is when the citizens decide that they are going to take control. They are not going to leave it to the politicians or to the profit makers. So that is a charge that we have in this country. If we want things to change, it's not too late. We have not lost power, but we need to start exercising the power and the rights and the voice that we do have. Very good. Well, I thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your ongoing commitment to your work, uh, to peoples across the world, across the globe, yes, as well as in Honduras. Um, feel better. I know you, you muscled through uh, a, a little bout of bronchitis that you're, you're mostly over, but I appreciate your doing that. And uh, please be safe. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. It's such a pleasure to speak with you. I appreciate the work that you do as well very much. Thank you. The shortage isn't food, it's democracy, wrote Frances Moore LePay in her trailblazing book, Diet for a Small Planet. That this statement remains painfully relevant 45 years after its initial publication is, on one hand, dispiriting. But, as we've seen, cause for optimism exists as well, here and around the planet. So go out and stake a claim at the community garden, support CSA, shop at the farmer's market in Arlington Center, visit the website of the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance and BEVS, otherworldsarepossible.org, to learn more about projects that are making a difference. In other words, go out and make salt. For Beverly Bell, I'm Peter Bermudis. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Wide Angle.